Hi guys, welcome back to another TechMinds video. So HF amplifiers can be extremely expensive, especially if you purchase something like an Acom or one from those top tier brands. But this amplifier shown here comes in at around $400. In this video, we'll check the power output and test it on air. Now its specification states that it can output up to 150 watts across nine different handbands. It can also handle up to a maximum input of 15 watts to provide that maximum output. But there is a four stage attenuator, meaning you can run the amplifier from lower powered radios like an ICOM 705 or even something like a Hermes Light 2 SDR transceiver, which in fact is what we're going to be using later in the video. Now on the left side of the rear of the amplifier, there's a DC power input along with the antenna out, which is in the form of an SO239 socket. Now in the middle, we see the main heatsink with a fan attached. Now this fan comes on at specific temperatures and can be controlled by the user within the menu settings. Now the fan is also extremely quiet and in the location where I had mine set up on the desk, I didn't even hear it after a while transmitting. Now on the right side of the rear panel is where things get interesting. Firstly, we have the RF input and again in the form of an SO239 socket. Above this, we have three 3.5 millimeter sockets labeled as RS232, band and TNR. Now the TNR socket is used to connect your transceivers PTT out, essentially grounding the center pin of that 3.5 millimeter socket to activate the amplifier into transmit mode. Now above this, we have a band socket. Now this can be used with specific radios like the FT817, a KX3 or the TRX2. In fact, if you're using something like the Hermes Light 2 with the IO board, you can construct your own interface so that the band switching is all controlled from the radio. However, this amplifier does actually have frequency sense and if activated from within the menu, the amp will automatically change bands depending on the frequency that is being transmitted into it. Now I'll show you this shortly. Above the band socket, we have an RS232 socket, which can be used with third party applications to either read the amp status or change parameters, supposedly. The up and down buttons on the left change the input gain. Now G4 is for around 2.5 watts, and G1 is most likely for that maximum of 15 watts input. The display button changes whether the amplifier shows output power, SWR, input voltage, current draw while the amp is in use, or the current temperature of the heatsink. The operation button changes whether the amp is in standby mode or operational mode. Now, standby mode does not amplify the input signal, so essentially bypassing it. The band up and band down buttons change the selected band. Now, technically this changes which filter is selected and is shown on the screen. The auto button allows the user to enable auto or put it back to manual mode. Now to enter the user configuration page, press and hold the display button. You can then use the up and down buttons to change the parameters of the selected setting. Now to change the next setting or next screen as it were, you can just press that display button again. The auto band select option allows F-Sense, which is automatically frequency sensing for the band selection, but there's also three other specific models that you can choose, such as an 817KX3 and TRX2 device. You can also change the SWR level in which the SWR protection kicks in. Now by default, this is three to one. There's also an over temperature protection, which is currently set at 70 degrees Celsius. Now you can also make some minor changes to the display, like the size of the bar graph when it's in use, and also whether that bar graph is reacting to SWR, to power, to volts, etc. Now to exit the menu, press the operation button and then just press the band plus button to save any changes that you have made. Now, like I said earlier, for testing, I'll be using my Hermes Light 2, which outputs a maximum of around five watts. And the software of choice to control the Hermes Light will be a specific build of Thetis, which is designed for use with the Hermes Light 2. Now on the bottom right of the screen, you can see the LCD of the amplifier. And if I change band on Thetis, and then just press the tune button to emit some RF from the Hermes Light, you'll notice that the band on the amplifier will change extremely quickly. Now this is using the F-Sense feature, which is built into the amplifier. 
Now the bands can also be changed remotely using the band selection port. Now the Hermes Light 2 has an optional I.O. board by N2 ADR and by using this I could connect a cable between the Hermes Light and the amp so that the band changes on the amp without the need to transmit first. Now I have yet to get that working but if you're interested in seeing the progression of that project then let me know down in the comments below and I may make another video on it going into slightly more depth. Now when it comes to testing the amplifier while connected into a dummy load, I did notice a variation between the nice eye power meter and the power reading on the amplifier's screen. Now unfortunately I cannot say with 100% certainty that the power meter on top of the amplifier is perfectly calibrated. Maybe it's time that I need to invest in a calibrated power meter. However, as I go through each of the bands, transmitting in FM with the amp gain set to G4, the input from the Hermes light appears to be less than 5 watts on each band. However, the amp is still outputting anything between 120 to 140 watts. Now here's a quick sample of using this amplifier on air. CQ, CQ40, Gold 6, India, November Uniform, listening. Mike Zero, Delta, Quebec, Whiskey. Mike Zero Delta Quebec Whiskey. Was it Mike Zero Delta Quebec Whiskey? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, Mike Zero Delta Quebec Whiskey, and I forgot to put the amplifier on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, M Zero DQW is the call sign. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Very good indeed. Okay. Yeah. It was. Uh, uh, yeah. It was quite low down at first. I was. Uh, I was lucky to get the, the call sign. So your name is Doug Delta Oscar Uniform Gold. Name is Doug. Yeah, G6INUM0DQW. Very very good afternoon to you, Doug. Uh, the name here is Matt, Mike Alpha Tango. And um, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm sweltering in my uh, in my office stroke shack at the moment. <laughs> anyway, microphone back to you, G6INUM0DQW. Now, one other test that I thought would be quite good would be to check out a web SDR and see what my transmitted audio sounded like, especially like the waveform, just to see if the signal was clean and where it should be. So take a listen to this. Uh, testing, testing, one, two, three, four, five, Mike Zero, Delta, Quebec, Whiskey, M0, DQW, just testing, M0, DQW, testing audio, one, two, three, four, five. This is Mike Zero, Delta, Quebec, Whiskey, just testing, testing only, testing only. Now I got this amp from Banggood and there didn't appear to be any real branding on this amplifier but I'm sure I'd seen this form factor before. The first version that I came across was on the Retivis website which is selling this same amp but for a higher cost to the end user compared to what Banggood was offering at. But this isn't where I'd seen this design before. In fact I'm nearly 100% sure that this amplifier is the Juma PA100D it's being sold on another website, which they claim to have the rights to reproduce this amplifier for $650. Now on the Banggood website, their price was only $379 with free shipping. So it kind of made sense to buy the cheaper option. But in fact, if you want one of these amps, I'll put a coupon code below so you can save a little bit more off of that. So lastly, let's take a look inside the amplifier to see if any of the boards can reveal any more information about its origin. Now, strangely enough, if you go onto the Juma website and actually have a look on their main page, they do actually have a link to pictures or photos of pirate copies of this amplifier. Now, while it looks the same and it looks extremely similar, there's no mention of any call signs or anything that would refer back to Juma apart from PA100. So while this is most likely a copy of the PA100D from Juma, it definitely does have some differences. And the first main difference is that the input and output RF connections are SO239 on this model, opposed to BNC on the Juma version. Now, taking a close look at the PA board, we notice some differences in the component layout. And more importantly, the two RF transistors are different from those used in the Juma PA100. Now, I'm sure some of you will most likely go ahead and research the difference between the RF transistors used in this model and the other one but let us know down in the comments what you find out. One other difference which I'm a bit disappointed about is that the RS-232 socket on the rear cannot be assigned to allow remote control of the amp or read the amp status. 
while it can be used with specific radios and specific CAT protocols, it doesn't have the option to control the amp fully by the RS-232 like we see in the Juma model. However, it does have a serial test mode, which does give you a kind of GUI. The remote option from the RS-232 settings within the menu is just not there, which is a shame because there's some pretty cool software tools you can use with the amp and including some really cool node red flows. Hopefully, whoever is making these PA100 amplifiers will enable this feature in a future firmware update. But the first task is finding an official manufacturer of these amps. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.